Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I know that there is a big presidential debate going on right now, so we appreciate you um, being here. Uh, my name is Miriam Morales Mickelson. I am the Executive Director of Teaching and Learning here in the Snohomish School District, and it is my honor to um, be here and be joined by um, some of our amazing staff members who are serving as panelists and presenters tonight to talk to you about early learning. They will introduce themselves when it is their turn to speak. The presentation will most be um, between 30 to 40 minutes in length. We'll save time in the end to answer questions that you might have. Because this is a webinar format, um, we're not able to unmute you so that you could ask your um, questions. So please take advantage of the Q&A box, type up your, answer, uh, your questions there. And just so you don't lose the question, type it as soon as it um, comes to mind. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll go through the Q&A box and answer those questions. We will stop right at 7, especially since there's a town hall that's starting at um, 7.30. So if you're interested in um, attending that, you'll have half an hour of, uh, of a break. If you walk away from today's presentation feeling overwhelmed, uh, unable to recall many of the details that we share with you, that is absolutely okay and um, rather normal, actually. Um, it might feel like drinking from a fire hose. Please don't worry. Um, we are recording tonight's presentation and we will post the video onto our district website. So feel free to rewatch the video if you have time um, and you just want to refresh your memory. I also so encourage you to uh, reach out to us at Teaching and Learning if you have any questions about your students and about early learning. So again, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. We hope that you find tonight's presentation helpful, educational, and informative. So without any further ado, I would like to turn things over to our first um, presenter, Shana Fogg. All right, thank you. Uh, so we are just, um, you saw Miriam Mickelson and um, Sherry Peach will be also joining us today. She's our early childhood TOSA and Britta Grass um, is our ECAP preschool program manager. I'm Shana Fogg. I uh, teach kindergarten at Machias. And uh, we're gonna start talking about ways that we can support our littlest kids um, with remote learning. I know a lot of kids right now are in the middle of, um, of remote learning and learning going on to Zoom for three, four year olds doing Zoom uh, circle times and meetings and trying to learn at home. And so we would like to just um, dig right into some of the things that we can do to support our kids when they are um, in the preschool years and attempting um, to do this kind of learning remotely. Um, as we get started, I would love for you to write in the Q&A. I know it's not really a question, it's really our question to you, of um, just introduce yourself and the age of kids that you either have at home or are working with. And so we can sort of tailor a little bit of this and understand who our audience is a little better. We will read um, through those comments so we get to know you a little better and can answer your questions easier too knowing how old your children are that you're working with. Uh, so getting started, uh, when we first started remote learning last spring, um, all of us sort of abruptly changed our routines and we didn't have a routine at all. And I am a parent of a four-year-old and a seven-year-old, so I was in the same thing as everyone else and realized that pretty quickly we would need to come up with a family routine. And that's been um, one of the saving pieces for us is just having a routine that my children can expect um, on a daily basis or whatever days of the week you're doing your online remote learning. Uh, for preschool, I know it's not five days a week often, it's maybe a few days a week that they have a Zoom meeting and other days they're doing activities um, independently or with adults. And so setting up a routine has been uh, a really, really important part of um, creating a, an environment for um, condu that's conducive for learning. Um, 
I'm going to have actually have Britta uh, Grass pop in here. She had a few ideas for ways to minimize distractions and help kids be successful during those remote learning times, especially when they're sitting in front of a computer more than we usually have them. Thanks, Shana. And I just want to say that having been around preschoolers as much as I have, I have so much empathy for folks who are trying to um, have kiddos do this successfully. The first thing that we want to really encourage everyone to do is find a routine that works for them. If you're in kindergarten and if you're in preschool, there are certain times that you need to attend and be online. Outside of that, it's parents as the first teacher's jobs to figure out how to keep the littles busy. Um, routine can be anything from making sure that we have meals timed out prior to or even during. Shana actually came up with that tip, <laughs> making <laughs> sure that there are snacks available during learning times. And we want to think about how much time a child of this age can actually spend focusing. Um, a good rule of thumb is thinking about their age and then adding a couple minutes on top of it. So for your average three-year-old preschooler, they're gonna give you maybe four to five minutes of undivided attention. So if you keep those things in mind and you try to keep it as positive as possible, um, we can kind of create a little bit of success with this online learning format. Um, we talked about minimizing distractions. A lot of children's um, workspace is frequently in their bedrooms, which totally understandable. Um, we've found that some parents have even figured out that if they turn their tablet or their laptop toward just kind of a plain wall during learning time, that it's a good visual signal for kids to focus in. There's also the thought of setting really clear expectations prior to even giving them access to their computer. Very simple words telling kids what to do instead of what not to do, such as when the teacher is talking, we sit and listen. When we are watching what's happening on the screen, we're paying close, close attention. And then modeling that for kids too, because these words that we're saying to some of these younger ones are things that might've never been said to them before. So sometimes we have to sit as parents and as teachers and say, this is what it looks like to pay attention and actually show them how to do it. Um, we talked about the developmentally appropriate activities um, when we were coming up with this presentation. Um, we really wanna see an emphasis on home activities for you as families, because all of the content that we're giving you is stuff that children naturally want to play. And that play will actually be what really solidifies those skills later on in life developmentally. And then the biggest thing is working at the level of success rather than frustration. It's okay to feel challenged and it's okay for things to not be completely easy. But really knowing your child and knowing that if they're in a frustrated state, that they're not learning any of the things that we're trying to present to them. All of these topics have come up in conversations with parents who have been trying to um, work with their children through this format. And um, these are things that also that we've used in the classroom that are applicable to this situation. So make sure that you, if you have any other questions about this or any other specific, um, you know, what do I do in this situation? when you're talking about learning at home, especially with the technology, please feel free to put it in the chat and we'll answer it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna take a few minutes. Um, we're gonna have the bulk of our presentation today be on the areas of development that we would um, watch children as they grow and develop over the preschool uh, years. And the major areas of development we'll be covering today are language, uh, physical development, so their large motor skills and their fine motor skills, social emotional development, cognitive development, uh, literacy, and math. These are all interrelated, and that's part of where we can call them out as separate areas of development, but what we find is when a student or a child is struggling in one area of development, it impacts all the other areas of de development as well. And so that's why we would like to really see um, see uh, parents really feel empowered to help their child. I know my two children are very different from one another uh, and one of them physically, he is just able to do things quickly and easily. He walked early, he crawled early, he's already riding a bike. He learned how to ride the bike 
his bike the same year that his three-year-old, seven-year-old brother, who's three years older than him, uh, learned how to. So developmentally, he's quite skilled in his large um, motor skills. However, other areas of development, he's not as skilled in. And so as a parent, I want to encourage him to um, continue to be confident in the areas he's developing well in, but also support the areas where he maybe needs a little extra support to develop. And so we'll go through those areas together this evening. The first area we'll cover um, is language, and uh, we have Sherry Peach here to present about language. Hi, I'm Sherry Peach. I'm the developmental, um, the early childhood TOSA. I do a lot with our developmental preschool, which is students with special needs, um, doing um, intake questions from parents if they have developmental concerns for their child, um, and get parents started in the right process if they need help um, through ECAP or other suggestions for preschool or if we need to evaluate them to meet those needs. And a number of our students that come in with when parents have concerns, a lot of it has to do with communication. Communication is a big area in the preschool realm because a lot of our kiddos are developing their communication and communication has a wide, wide range of um, where children are. You may have one child that started speaking full sentences at the age of two that you had a hard time keeping up with, or you could have other children that are only saying two word sentences at the age of two and putting two words together. And actually both of those are developmentally appropriate. So we like to let parents know that there's a wide range in communication that you may see in your preschoolers. And um, a lot differs from some girls and boys, but even, even in that area, there's a wide range for what is appropriate. The, the areas that we'll be sharing with you tonight, um, we did a lot of um, talking with kindergarten teachers, things that they would like to, skills they would like to see children coming to kindergarten with. But we didn't want parents to feel overwhelmed, like your child isn't ready for kindergarten unless they have all these skills. And so that's where we came with the uh, um, sentence that you'll see, give me a chance to. And so what our team would like to share with you is just a way that we can reach out to parents and tell them things that they can give um, their preschool age students opportunities to do before they come to kindergarten. This is also appropriate for those kindergarten parents where the kindergartners haven't started in person yet. Things that you can work on while you're at home um, with your child and encourage. Um, even as I was a special educator and I worked on these things, I've noticed um, being in our developmental preschools that sometimes I would tend to want to give the children too much help and we really need to encourage them to do things on their own. Um, you may find in a household setting um, that you think your child's following directions and knows how to do things well, but then when you come um, into a setting where you may have 15 or 16 kids with one teacher, following those group type directions and things like that are difficult. So the first thing is just giving your child a, a chance to greet others appropriately, letting them know it's safe, um, and even reaching out to people um, that you might see in the store or things like that. Sometimes with stranger danger, <laughs> we take it too generally, and we have some of these preschoolers that um, then come to kindergarten and all of a sudden everybody is new in their life. So just, you know, working on greeting others and um, saying hi and goodbye and peers and other kids at the park. All of this is great ability to um, start greeting others. And then having back and forth conversations. I've found even as myself as a mother, especially when a preschooler comes home, from preschool, they don't tend to want to give you a lot of information about how the day went. So you tend to ask them a lot of questions and not having that back and forth conversation, waiting, pausing, um, asking them open-ended questions instead of just, did you have fun at school today? Where the 
typical preschool answer is going to be yes. Um, so asking him something even more specific, what did you have for snack? What did you play? Um, what's your favorite toy to play with at school? Who are some friends that you have? Asking these leading questions help them um, hold on to a conversation. Even talking about um, their feelings is a great way to do this also. And then following three verbal directions with two or three steps. And these are getting a little more complex. So maybe not within the daily routine, but some of the directions they're gonna get as they move forward to kindergarten are going to be directions that aren't quite in the daily routine, such as put your folder in your cubby, get your coat in your backpack, and then line up at the door. That would be a four-step directions, which is even more. But some things that you can do at home is giving them the general directions within the daily routine, but then try to play it up a little bit and give them a silly direction because preschoolers really like this. So if you can say, uh, put your shoe on the dog and then, and then get your coat or something like that, you might lose a shoe, but it'll be entertaining for a while. And we all know we need entertainment during this time. Um, and then just having them express their needs and wants and asking for help when needed. And a good way to do this is not only to ask them to ask you for help, but for example, if somebody wants a glass of milk and you're right there standing by them, have them ask a sibling or someone else to give them because that way you can model it for them and they're practicing asking for help. And then talking about what that's gonna look like as they move forward to kindergarten. Um, of course, with kids being there a full day, they're gonna need to go to the bathroom raise their hand and following through some of those rules as a teacher talks to them and letting them know it's okay to ask. Um, those are all important ways that you can help your preschooler and soon to be kindergartner at home. And then as far as physical daily living skills, give them a chance to dress themselves. A lot of times what we find with kindergartners is even just getting the coat on and off quickly um, is hard. I One of my favorite children books has a poor little girl trying to get all of her winter clothes on, which we don't have as much here in the Northwest. But by the time she got her boots, her scarf, her jacket, her hat, everyone had already come in from recess and she missed out on recess. Um, so being able to get things on, on and off quickly and knowing where they go. I know I'm still working with some of my middle schoolers, having them put their clothes and everything in the right place. So have, having them know where to hang them up at home is very helpful because then they'll get set in that routine and be able to do it when they get to school. Um, as far as opening snacks and serving themselves, um, serving by themselves, this is a big problem when it comes to um, it comes to school because all of the tricky yogurts that they can't open or um, I know my kids used to like to take the squeezable yogurts that you push up and they could never tear the top completely off. So we put a little pair of scissors, kid scissors in their lunchbox so they could just cut it off. Um, and they still to this day, they cut them off, they don't tear them off and they're, they're older. But just being making sure that whatever you send in the, their lunch, they've had practice opening so they can do it quickly. Um, there's not a lot of time left, <laughs> left in the daily schedule. And when everyone else goes out for recess, they want to follow quickly. So making sure they can open things in their lunch quickly and being able to, they'll be more apt to eat all their food and be independent in that. And then going to the bathroom independently. And this includes coming back out of the bathroom with your pants pulled up. <laughs> As preschool teachers, we tend to, to, you know, kids are so busy and they're thinking of the next thing. So talking about those steps and using the bathroom time when they're at home, making, especially now, making sure they wash their hands and remember all those steps. Um, just 
And if you need to, and this is often common in the in the school as far as there's a hand washing chart usually up by all the sinks to talk how to wash your hands appropriately, you can actually pull that up some if you just Google it, a hand washing chart, and you could have that at home. So they could be practicing with the steps with those pictures to make sure they're doing every one. And then another common one that kindergarten teachers would really appreciate is knowing when they need to blow their nose and then washing their hands afterwards. And doing this is, which would be helpful to kindergarten teachers and preschool teachers alike, is if you notice a child needs to blow their nose, maybe giving them a little hint, but not you being the one to tell them. And so they'll start learning the signs of when it's appropriate to go get a Kleenex and, and wipe their nose and then wash their hands afterwards. And then the last or the next one I'm going to talk about is um, physical fine motor and hand strength. Um, so a lot of a lot of things that are used in school are drawing and writing and using things like glue and tape and scissors. And all of this takes strength and practice. Um, one of the reasons we like to use pencils and crowns as opposed to markers is pencils and crowns take a certain amount of pressure in order to, to use them. And that also gives them the, the experience of the drag of those, of those um, writing utensils across the paper. And that's important for functioning their for writing their letters. As far as use of scissors, being able to start um, using those, giving them a chance to cut lines um, and possibly cut out circles or squares. Those are things that if they can have that skill as they move on to kindergarten, it will really help them. And then a lot of times with our little, as students are learning sounds and letters, they'll cut out the shape of the letter and they either glue or tape it to a paper. Um, ways that you can do this at home don't necessarily have to be workbook, but just putting materials out and letting a, children do an art collage or something that would just be fun. Preschoolers do not need a set art project that's going to look in, you know, like this when it's finished. Let them use their imagination and see what they can make. Um, drawing pictures and shapes are very important for the forming of letters. So even if they're not forming letters yet, drawing circles, triangles, squares, all those work into letter formation. And those are very important things to practice with at home. Um, and then as they do begin to write their letters, working on the letters in their name first, um, because those, those, name, those are letters that are familiar with to them. And then also working on letters of letting them write um, names of other people in the family as they move forward. And then the, the last one I wanna share is um, building that hand strength. I know a lot of kindergarten teachers have concerns because when students are working on their writing, they'll see little light lines and it's hard to read. Um, so we like to build that hand strength by pushing um, pulling, grabbing, kneading, pounding. Play-Doh is a great thing for this silly putty. Um, and stringing beads, um, hammering. It's pumpkin time, so you can hammer golf tees into a pumpkin and then pull them out. All those type of things will build on that hand strength. And the other thing for fine motor, if you're really concerned with your child's fine motor, you can look, just Google fine motor activities for preschool, and you'll see a whole lot of activities that are fun and exciting for kids. And then the last is the gross motor body strength and balance. So give them time to climb, jump, run, crawl, swing, throw, kick, and bounce. Um, and just let them use their large motor skills. This helps with helping them keep up with others on the playground, um, works on eye-hand coordination, also gets the wiggles out. So if you're in the middle, of, if you finished a Zoom and you have a half an hour till the next Zoom, letting them get these gross motor activities is a great way to help them attend and do things um, 
better for the next zoom. And then building and digging, building with blocks. You can even, if anyone else is like me and ordering a lot from Amazon right now, you can keep those Amazon boxes and you could have enough probably to build a fort. Um, so you could save those and have them build in their garage or bring them into the living room. Um, but just have, you know, those large motor activities. And if you find your child's very wiggly, one thing that really helps is if we give them heavy work. So something heavy to do, like carrying something heavy, um, like a gallon of water outside and running around and seeing how many laps they can do. Um, a, another good way that you can easily set up uh, obstacle course in your home, especially when it starts getting rainy. And as long as you don't mind them climbing over some furniture or under some chairs, um, you can just, you can just, once you model that obstacle course for them, they can follow through and you can start timing them. Little preschoolers love to be timed and love to beat their own time. And it's amazing how many times you can get them to do an obstacle course, you might be a little tired of it by the end, but they certainly probably won't. And then let them think of ideas of what they could add to the obstacle course. Thank you, Sherry, for sharing that. Um, I know that my family has used a lot of cardboard boxes lately to build with and draw on. So it's been a good source of imaginary play for our kids as well. All right, we have uh, Britta next with social emotional Display and displaying independence. Hi, thank you again for having me. So again, I'm the director for the ECAP, the Early Childhood Education and Assistance Program here in Snohomish. And one of our primary objectives is, we'd like to say not getting ready for kindergarten, but getting ready for life. And as we can all appreciate, social skills are one of the top things that we wanna see good community members displaying out in the world. Um, so I'll go through this a little bit fast because um, Sherry actually with some of her um, suggestions touched on some of these things which are great for social emotional development in addition to it because just that act as a parent of joining with your child and positively playing with them and encouraging to do those kinds of things um, really sets the stage for great learning. Um, one thing we want to make sure that kids get a chance to follow daily routine and expectations Kids even as young as two and three can find little chores around the house that they're very enthusiastic about doing. Um, and then within asking children to do those things, making sure that there's transparency, I'm asking you to help with this because when we work together, it makes everyone in the house feel happy. It makes our house work better. Giving children a reason for why we do things rather than just because mom and dad said so, which that's okay sometimes too, are great ways for them to foster that thinking about why am I doing this and how am I in charge of what I choose to do. So with daily routines, Sherry had talked about some visual cues with bathroom routines. I really encourage families to make a visual routine for everything that's happening in the house. Doesn't have to have time on it, doesn't even have to necessarily have letters on it, especially if your children are really young, but pictures that show when we get up, we brush our teeth. When we're done brushing our teeth, we have breakfast, whatever your routine is as a family. And if the kids can join together in making those with you, they're even more powerful tools. Um, I would like to ask everybody to give their children a chance to try new and challenging things. This can be anything from what Sherry suggested about climbing and balancing on something that might look a little intimidating and letting them know that I see you working and I see you struggling. And even though it's a little bit hard and uncomfortable, you can do it, that's amazing. Those are the things that build those kinds of confidence and independence skills in young children that they can apply to learning and to life. We wanna ask kids to be able to ask for help too though. Not help for things that we know that they can do themselves. It's okay to say, I'd like to see what it looks like when you try to do that before you step in as an adult and help. But letting them know that they can ask for help is an essential skill, especially when you're in a school community because a lot of the times the kids who don't access as much as they need to from education are the ones who are a little bit too shy and a little bit too intimidated to speak up. And we want them to know that it's okay to advocate for themselves and say, I need some help with this right now. Making mistakes is a big part of that as well. Um, one thing that we really struggle with is the shutdown, I can't do it kind of attitude that comes from a lot of kids and we call it 
learned helplessness. There's parenting books all over the place about it and that kind of thing. The number one thing that you can do as an adult helping a young child to not have those behaviors is to let them know that it's okay to make mistakes. So even if it's super frustrating for us as adults, if they do something, letting them know that it's not a character flaw, it's something that was not perfect and some things aren't perfect and we learn from it. And that makes it so we can do things better next time. Um, and then the get messy portion of it too. I take two or three changes of clothes to work as a preschool teacher because if you're not getting messy, then you're not quite engaging all those senses that you need to do. And it's really motivating for kids as well. So the expressing feelings portions of social emotional is not just for um, mental health. This is also an independent skill when it gets down to it. We wanna show children that it's absolutely okay to have a feeling. The best way to get through it is to be able to name your feeling and then know an appropriate way to express that feeling in a community environment. Again, this is where transparency comes in, calling attention to children that, okay, you're having a big feeling. I can tell that it feels really tight in your stomach right now. Maybe your face feels really hot. And modeling for ourselves, when I feel really frustrated when I'm driving in traffic, I hold on really tight to the steering wheel and then letting them know, but I still stay safe. And it's okay to give your children examples of what kinds of behaviors you'd like to see them do to stay safe. And if they're safe citizens coming into kindergarten, they're going to be able to learn. Um, we really encourage people to um, take, talk about um, taking breathing breaks. You, there's a thousand YouTube videos, <laughs> like very, very entertaining ones, about calm down breaths with children. We teach the second step curriculum in our ECAP program, and it talks about putting your hand on your belly and taking three deep breaths um, before saying anything about how you're feeling so that you can really think really hard and feel it before you say it. I keep having to move the chat box out of the way of my text here. <laughs> And then the building relationship portion. This is the big thing that I know that we're really struggling with with remote learning, that our children aren't coming together in community with other kids to practice these things. So some suggestions that we have um, you know, in this you know, different environment is to sit down with your children, engage with them in media that are about these topics. So if you don't have a chance to go out and meet people your own age and actually let kids do what they do naturally, which is get together and play and teach each other social skills, perfect time to go to the library and get a book that's all about that and talk about it with your child. It's a perfect time to pretend. It's a perfect time to bring out doy, uh, toys and dolls and that kinds of things that can put together social scenarios so that your child might be able to verbalize it. Um, one thing I like to tell families when they're teaching their children social skills in that really explicit way is that children are able to say a rule before they can apply it to themselves. So just remember that if your four and five-year-old is saying, you know, so-and-so needs to share those toys, but then you see them go and snag a toy from somebody else five minutes later, totally developmentally appropriate. It's also appropriate for us to remind them that that's not the way that we work in community, but that's totally, totally ex um, ex <laughs> expected behavior. Um, solving um, problems with others is also extremely important with these building relationships. Being able to um, say things like, I was using that first, advocating for yourself and also being able to um, think of solutions to social problems. And again, if you don't have the opportunity to put your child into a social situation where they can practice that with other children or siblings right now, then I really encourage you to get online, use that media, use some books, um, even tell stories from when you were a child. Children have been learning from oral stories for years. And then flexible thinking is a really important one too. And this comes back into that dealing with emotions and feeling. It's totally okay to tell a child that it's not time for them to get what they want. Letting them know that, yeah, that feels uncomfortable and maybe you'll get it later. And then following through as adults and being consistent and calm when we're helping them with those things. And then sharing their ideas. And this is part of linguistic and cognitive development as well. A lot of times kids are super curious about the world around them. And it takes us just slowing down and listening to their words and trying to see what they're focusing on and paying attention and helping them, you know, get that language about asking questions. Why is the bird flying? Why are things floating? Um, why is, you know, there's, there's, there's a million times during the day throughout the house that things are happening 
that the children will have wonderful ideas of how to solve problems for. Um, this really, really does tie in with cognitive focusing because children, when they're in that frustrated or in that really emotional state, are not able to access any kind of learning. And so, again, a lot of transparency about how the brain works with children. When you're calm, when you're paying attention, showing them what paying attention means, and when you're listening, your brain is able to learn lots and lots of new things. Um, we can practice this by listening to stories, again, asking questions, modeling for them how to, you know, open-ended questions from adults are sometimes the best way to get kids to produce those ideas that you would have never expected would have been there. Um, one of the things that we really would like to see is that practice cleaning up those messes that we make. That is some of the best problem solving that's there. And you want to make it accessible. So again, this comes down to routine and how you um, structure your learning environment. But making sure that children know that there's a place where things go at the end of the day when they're done playing with it. There's a way for things to get cleaned up. And then letting them do as many of those things as independently as possible and being super encouraging will give them those skills that they can apply to learning later. Um, and talking about how the world works, again, that curiosity um, linguistically that I had some kids who can name off six or seven dinosaur names that I could never in a million years pronounce on my own. So the sky's the limit as long as we have, as adults are guiding alongside with them and really paying attention to their interests. <laughs> again, with the mistakes, make mistakes and fix them. If you have a child who's really prone to frustration, one of the best things that you can do is uh, play Jenga with them. <laughs> it's a really tricky thing to know that, you know, we can build this really cool looking thing and all it takes is one move for it to fall down. But then we can build it back up again. So their play opportunities when they're trying to put things together, make ramps for their cars, make the baby fit into the um, high chair, snap the buttons on the baby's clothes, all of those things that preschoolers and kindergartners naturally do are opportunities for us to come along and let them know you are solving a problem. Ask them, what's another way that this could happen? And then be ready to model and demonstrate if it's at their level of frustration that they can't do it. Um, and again, the expressing what we need goes right along with the linguistic parts that Sherry talked about earlier. Um, and being able to share ideas is also part of that social relationship building. And then of course, waiting and taking turns. There is nothing more powerful than telling a small child that waiting is extremely hard and it doesn't feel very good, but it's something that we can do. And if we can do it, then there's reward later on. Um, I teach the kids in my preschool a little waiting song that they can do. So find something that works for you guys and um, teach your children some different things they can do to distract themselves while they're waiting. So dramatic play, again, this is also the great way to work on those social relationship skills right now. Um, we see a lot of kids who don't pretend in the way that um, they used to. And we're, uh, you know, there's cultural aspects of that and that kind of thing that have come into play as far as screen time and that kind of stuff. But being able to play and be silly and dramatic, as Sherry said, if you're going to have an art project, letting them have the freedom to do it however they like, those are things that really build cognitive experiences as well as confidence and independence. And so now Shane is going to take over after she unmutes herself and is gonna take us through a few words about literacy and math. Thank you, Britta. All right, so a lot of you are um, parents or caregivers of the really young preschoolers, and you might be thinking, well, you know, learning names and letters is a little bit um, high end for my kid. And there is definitely a developmental part where kids at a certain age, two, three-year-olds, they can really care less about the letters. And as I think Sherry talked about earlier, when we talk about shapes and um, and uh, the colors and, and drawing shapes or, um, during our uh, playtime, we are actually building the blocks for recognizing letters. And when we think about literacy for the very, very young kids, the, mo the best, best thing you can do as a parent, of course, is just to sit down and read with your child. 
uh, building the love of reading and the love of the story and sitting together and enjoying that time together is the number one most important thing you can do. And the rest of the pieces will come later. If you have an older child, um, if you have a four or five year old who is um, going to be into kinder in kindergarten very soon, or maybe it's the beginning of the kindergarten year right now, and uh, you want to support them in some of their literacy growth, some things you can do is just singing the ABC song together. It's anytime we connect a song to a routine or a new skill or new learning, it's easier for that to stick in their brain. Uh, other things they can do are play with um, magnetic letters and puzzles with letters in them. Uh, play is the most important um, word in that, that it's playful and fun. Uh, I see a lot of parents who really, really, really want their child to learn certain letters. And of course we all do, but if the child is feeling frustrated or feeling like their parent is making them do something that they don't want to do, they're not going to be learning during that time anyway. So playing around with letters, uh, something I, uh, did was I buried the magnetic letters for my son's name in a, a sensory bin. I had some noodles and stuff. And so I took the magnetic letters for his name and buried them in there. And he dug through all of the noodles and found the letters of his name. And then we put them in the right order. So it was a fun, playful activity. He wanted to do it again and again. Uh, other things you can do is while you're reading books is look for the letters, um, look for important letters, maybe uh, the letters in your child's name or just other letters. Uh, we like to read the elephant and piggy books and there's usually a lot of, uh, a lot of words that are written and there's one at the very end where um, one of the characters says, wow, and it's in a speech bubble. So we looked at the letters and we talked about W-O-W-O -O, that says, wow. And I don't know if my son will remember those letters the next day, but he's being exposed to them in a, in a regular way, and um, that will help him be able to identify those letters later. Um, another thing is to connect the letter name to the shape of the letter. And so that's, again, just naming the letter. When you see them using those magnetic letters and saying, oh, that's an A, that's an I. So those, uh, those skills are going to be really important as they continue into kindergarten and first grade as well. Uh, Starting to write, little kids are actually ready to write a lot earlier um, than we might think, but writing is probably different in a preschool um, in preschool than what we traditionally think of as writing. So um, how ways we help kids start to write are, again, recognizing the letters in their name, and maybe if they're ready to hold a pencil and start writing their name. If they're not ready to hold that pencil because they're two years old, that's totally understandable. Um, the way they might write is, is they're picking up a crayon and they're drawing on a piece of paper and they drew a, maybe a scribble and they said, oh, look, mom, I wrote my name. That's the beginning of writing for the little kids. Um, we pretend writing is still writing for the little ones. So uh, I like to, in kindergarten classrooms, I like to create um, places where the kids might write lists or notes or cards to one another. So we have a mailbox that they could mail a letter to each other. And again, if it's just scribbles at first, that's fine. If the scribbles start to then form into the shapes of letters, that's great. As those letters have meaning, those letters will start to carry that sound. And then those sounds, those letters, those strings of letters have sounds attached to them. And, those, and the child is really learning the process for writing. Um, I have, when the kids are playing in their dramatic play area, uh, I put a little notepad there and maybe they're, one day they're working at a coffee shop and they're taking the coffee order. So they're writing the, the coffee order down on a list or writing the check out. Uh, those are all ways that kids pretend to write and start to learn those writing skills. Um, another really, really important um, piece is to give kids a chance to just have books in their hands and treat and use those books correctly. Uh, little kids, they don't, you know, they're going to bite books. They're going to fold them up in half. They're going to maybe even step on them. And that's understandable. But as they get a little bit older and are capable, we teach them how to hold a book and turn the pages from left to right. So, that, and as they're sitting in your lap and reading with you, they'll naturally start to notice you always turn the pages the same direction. Um, give them a chance to have books in their bedrooms and pretend to read them. My son, one of my sons, when he was three years old, he spent an hour pretending like he was sleeping in bed and he wasn't, he was actually reading books the whole time. And clearly he wasn't really reading them, but he was paging through the books for an hour at bedtime uh, because he had them in there. 
when you also um, talking about books and asking questions, this has come up several times with, when we talk about cognitive development, language development, it's all interrelated. And then finally, um, visiting the library, uh, they have the public library is still having virtual story times. Uh, when you're able to check out books from the library, those are all good sources. We're gonna move on to math and then we'll have a chance for some questions and answers. And so if you are thinking, oh, I've got a few questions right now, feel free to put them into the Q&A box and we will respond to them. Uh, so in, in preparing kids for um, developing their mathematical understanding, something that uh, we wanna make sure we give a, kids a chance to do is just simply count out loud and count anything. And you don't have to have a lot of things to count. For example, um, you might get the kids on the ground and start counting push-ups. We're all doing push-ups or even pretend push-ups. Uh, we might be counting our jumping jacks. So we are getting kids active and moving around and we're also practicing counting out loud. The kids are learning learning the order of the numbers. Um, we have objects that they can touch and count. Uh, it, I, tomorrow I'm doing a kindergarten lesson and I pulled some beans out of my garden that were getting really big. And so we're gonna open up the bean pod and count how many beans are inside the bean pod. And that's just touching and counting those objects really helps the kids. Um, helps the kids learn the one-to-one -one correspondence, meaning one, one number for one object or one number for one push up. Um, we all know that kids uh, naturally are going to be interested in shapes. I think shapes are fun and interesting and the kids tend to think that too. Uh, when I give them a chance to tell me, oh, would you want, want to tell me about numbers or do you want to tell me about shapes? And almost all of them want to tell me about their shapes that they know first. Um, so give them a chance to just name those shapes. When you see them around the house, uh, we have uh, our our math curriculum for elementary is Bridges Math. And if you go online, they have um, Math in Our World and it's a free parent resource you can click on. And it's um, things that you can find in our world all the time that are mathematical. So you're walking down the street and you see a stop sign and there's a shape to talk about. Uh, anything, the wheels on the on the cars that the kids are playing with, they're the shape of a wheel or the shape of a circle. And then you can also of course count them. Uh, also just making sure that you're in a Integrating the names of colors into your conversation with kids um, are really important. Naming them, finding them, um, going on scavenger hunts. Maybe see if you can find something outside that's red and orange and yellow, and maybe you make a scavenger hunt just to get the kids outside. Or if it's super rainy, look for them inside the house. Another piece that uh, we are um, helping kids as they get grow older is um, starting to develop the sense of having collections and sorting those collections. Um, collecting things um, helps kids develop that sense of um, just knowing the quantities of something. So uh, when we get a collection and we quantify them, meaning we, we count them up and find out how many are there, that helps kids understand how many, a big amount, a small amount, and uh, then we can sort those collections. So we take familiar objects like um, toys and balls and blocks and Legos um, and sort them by um, color or size. Uh, we could take our matchbox cars if you have boys or girls that have matchbox cars too, and they can um, and sort them by the, the color, of course, would be the first one, but then ask them, is there another way you could sort them? Maybe they could sort them by the type of car. We had farm vehicles and race cars. And so there are different ways to sort the same collection as well. Uh, another item that is really important is helping children learn how to um, count up a small group of items, like up to about six items for kindergarten. Younger kids would be fewer items, of course, um, and be able to just count them up quickly and easily. Um, and then playing games together, playing games with dice where you roll the die and you count up, um, that will help you, your child learn um, something called subitizing, which is when they see a number over and over and over again, they automatically know, oh, that's four. They don't have to count all four dots. They know that's what four looks like. 
uh, it's very common for kids to be able to do that to, to two and then they build up to, they can do the subitize to three and four and so on. Um, up to six items, especially using a dice helps that and it's fun and playful. Um, the big piece that I want to remind everybody is that all of these things that we're giving kids a chance to do, um, the language give me a chance to is really important because we're not forcing anyone to do anything. We're not, um, we're, if we force that to happen, it's not, we're gonna take away the learning. We're giving them an opportunity. They're giving kids an opportunity to learn new things at the pace that is interesting and appropriate for them and for their age. We're gonna move on to some question time. So if you have, a question, you can write that in the chat. And um, we have just a few minutes for questions. And if somebody um, else, I had a few questions that I've heard over the years that I also thought of if you don't have any, but I could um, always give you a chance to write in the chat if you have any questions. Looks like the chat's still empty, Shana. What we were talking earlier about a couple mm -hmm. that I thought were really great ones to hit on. Um, I was thinking about uh, a couple of um, one that uh, came up was um, having a kid who is young for their grade. They're they are, have a boy or a girl who just turned five, and they're wondering, well, they turn five in July. Will they be ready for kindergarten? Um, I think. That's probably the number one question I get from parents as a kindergarten teacher is, is my child going to be ready for kindergarten, especially if they have a summer birthday? Um, does anyone, um, Britta, do you want to talk about that? Or I can also address that as well. Some th things to consider. Well, the, the number one thing to consider is that this word ready is really um, a construct, as you had talked about before, that um, doesn't really apply when you're talking about development. We're talking about a range of abilities across all of these different developmental areas that we talked about, and no child is going to be ready in the traditional sense, the same as another child is going to be ready. In general, if your child is continuing to learn and make progress in all of these areas, our kindergarten teachers are wonderful. They're very skilled at um, differentiating to make sure that the children will still have a great learning experience as they go in. It's really rare, um, and we, we frequently have kiddos who start with us who are three in ACAP, but sometimes we get kiddos who just get a couple of months of pre-K right at the end of the school year. It is really rare to run across a child who is quote unquote too immature for kindergarten. So um, I encourage people to do what they think is best, of course, for their children. But as those conversations come up, I, again, super rare to meet kiddos who are not ready if they've had exposure and opportunities to try at least most of these things or things that are similar. Mm -hmm. And I think um, Sherry could also talk a little bit about there might be areas where your child, you feel like your child is very ready for kindergarten, but there's an area that you're worried about to maybe um, their speech that you don't think that their speech is, um, is the where, where it should be uh, or their physical development. Maybe they're not um, being able to do some things that you would expect them to do. And so Sherry, could you talk a little bit about that if um, parents have concerns about just even one or two areas of development that they feel like they're struggling with? So one of the things within Snohomish School District that we do have is special education services for kiddos who are struggling in one cer in certain areas that may need some extra help. Um, and if a student would qualify for those services, then we could give them supports as they enter kindergarten. Um, and normally it would be the kindergarten teacher that would address those with you, um, but we do have ways to support um, students in those areas of need. Um, a lot of times it is communication. Um, we have a lot of kiddos that have articulation delays that may be hard to understand. And we have speech and language services for those um, students. If they're not, if the needs are um, not age appropriate, there's a wide range of even sounds like SH and CH and TH that come even up to six years old. So, um, but, being able to communicate effectively really helps and your kindergarten team will be able to help you with that. 
um, as far as if they see a need where the child may need extra help or support. Um, but we also find in kindergarten that peers are a good model and a good help for that also. Um, so just being around other peers, having good models, that's also helpful. And not everybody, like Britta says, comes to kindergarten with all the same skills. Um, and some have strengths and some have weaknesses. And the more they work on those weaknesses, they become then strengths later. Um, so for parents, just to realize by giving them those opportunities, they will learn. And so what you're looking at is continued growth. And if you don't see continued growth, that's where you would want to express concern to your child's teacher and um, let them know that this is a concern that you would have. Thank you, Sherry. Are there other questions that may have come up? I'm going to check the chat. I, it looks a little empty right now. So, um, you know, I think that we've hopefully covered a lot of your questions um, as we are going through our presentation. And thank you um, for listening and um, tuning into this webinar today. Um, I just want to say thank you and thank you for everything you're doing for your own children. Um, it's really, it takes a lot right now. And um, I appreciate everything that all the parents are doing, especially as a kindergarten teacher and a parent myself, I know how hard it is. So, um, and just know that we appreciate you. 100%. And, and I'm going to pass along a little wisdom that was told to me when I was the ECAP parent. In parenting, you are the first teacher try your best for 80% of the time to be on and congratulate yourself if you're 30% on because really it is really, really hard work and there's no perfect way to do it. Just enjoy yourselves, enjoy your children and a lot of the rest will fall into place if they're given these experiences. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you, panelists. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Miriam. Have a good night. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Shana. Thank you, everybody.